God bless you, you deed, and shalom, beloved ones. Join me as we go on a journey together, discovering how the writings of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament connect. I'm going to leave my life. I'm going to leave my life for Yeshua. Shalom, Yedidim, and God bless you, beloved ones. My name is Messianic Rabbi K.A. Schneider. Sometimes people wonder, what is this about? And that represents the Word of God that's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce between the division of soul and spirit, even the bone and its marrow. I remember preaching in a church one time, and uh, I just sensed that there was real resistance in the congregation this particular day. And so I just stopped in the middle of my preaching, and I went, Psh, Psh, Psh. and afterwards the pastor was really wondering what the heck that was about. But what it is, is it's the word of the Lord. Bless his holy name. May you use that, Father God, as a spiritual impartation, Father, that will break into our hearts and bring life for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in the midst now, beloved. We are approaching or in the midst of the season of Passover. And the dates of this year's Passover are going to be at the end of the broadcast today. Did you know that Passover is the crown jewel of the feast that God gave to Israel? In fact, when the Lord gives Israel his special holy days, in the book of Leviticus chapter 23, the Lord says, these are my appointed days. So it's interesting that when we have Passover, and some of you have heard of some of the other holidays that we typically call the Jewish holidays, uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Rosh Hashanah, Jewish people celebrate as the New Year, uh, Shavuot, or the feast that we call Pentecost, and other of the Jewish holidays as well, the Feast of Sukkot or Tabernacles. Many people think of these as the Jewish holidays, but yet even beloved ones, the Lord never called them Jewish holidays, but rather he called them, listen now, my appointed days. And so when the Lord lists all these days, all these days that people often term the Jewish holidays, in Leviticus 23, the Lord doesn't say these are the Jewish holidays, but rather he says these are my holidays appointed day. So these are the feast of the Lord or the feast that we could say Yahweh, which is the Lord's personal name. Most Semitic scholars feel that God's personal name, which comes from the four Hebrew letters, Yud, He, Vav, He, is pronounced a breathy Yahweh. That's the name of the God and Father of the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, hallelujah, Hamashiach. And so as we approach now the spring feast, we're coming, first of all, to the feast that we call in Hebrew, Pesach, which we call Passover. Now, many Christians that are watching the broadcast today, you're somewhat familiar with Passover. In fact, Passover is oftentimes an introduction to a Christian church's appreciation for her Jewish roots, for the Jewish roots of Christianity. Many of you that are watching the broadcast right now perhaps have gone to what we call a messianic Seder. In other words, we've gone through uh, somewhat of the traditional order of the Jewish Passover liturgy, and then we've shown how Jesus completes it. And we even bring in the fact that when Jesus instituted what we call the Lord's Supper in Luke 22, it was actually a Passover meal. We're going to talk about that today. Unfortunately, what I found is that oftentimes a church will do a Passover meal. They'll have a Messianic Passover for the congregation, bring in a Jewish believer like myself to conduct it or have somebody in the congregation that knows how to do it, do it. But that will be as far as they'll go in exploring the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. They'll think, oh, well, we did a Passover a couple years ago, and so we've got the Jewish roots thing covered. And of course, uh, I'm here to say to you that... Uh, Understanding the Jewish roots of our faith, beloved, is so much more than understanding how Jesus is the fulfillment of Passover. Understanding Passover from a Messianic perspective is an awesome and a great beginning, but it's certainly not the end. And just because someone may have gone to a Messianic Passover service one year, that doesn't mean that they've got the Jewish roots thing covered because Jesus said to the woman of Samaria in John 4, 22, woman, that what, she wasn't Jewish. And Jesus said to her, woman, you don't know what you're worshiping. We know we worship for salvation from the Jews. We should understand all our faith in Messiah from a Jewish perspective. The whole book of Hebrews is about the sacrificial system and the priesthood and how we understand our faith in Jesus by understanding Levitical priesthood. And so very, very important to appreciate the Hebrew works of uh, uh, roots of our faith, not just to understand the Passover, but to understand all of it. 
But we are now in the midst of the spring holidays, Passover being the first of the Lord's appointed day in the spring. And I want to talk to you today about Passover. And I want to say, first of all, beloved, that Passover really is the gospel that Jesus brought us in its primitive form. When you look at the key elements in the Passover story, it really is the gospel that was revealed to us through Jesus in the New Testament in its primitive form. All the themes of redemption are contained in the Passover experience that we read about in the book of Exodus, chapter number 12. Now, understand that that, that, what, uh, that what we, when we look at the elements in, in, uh, in Exodus chapter 12 of the Passover, they were both literal and historical, and they were also prophetic. Let me explain what I mean. In Exodus 12, Israel was a type of the church. Pharaoh was a symbol of Satan. The lamb uh, that, was, that was slain and whose blood was applied over the doorpost, of course, that was a symbol of Jesus. In fact, the New Testament actually tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 that Jesus Christ, that Yeshua Mashiach, has become our Passover. That's why Jesus is referred to in the book of Revelation at least 29 times as the Lamb of God. Where does that term lamb come from? It goes all the way back to Exodus 12, the Passover lamb. The blood, obviously, that was put over the doorpost of the, of the children of Israel in Exodus 12 is a symbol, prophetic symbol of the blood that's placed over our lives when we come into relationship with, with Jesus. And as a result of that, we're, we're spared from the judgment of the wrath of God. And so all the different elements of the Passover in its initial historical context were literal and real. And Israel is a real people but yet it was also prophetic in the, point, in the sense that it pointed to what the Lord Jesus would do for us in Messiah Jesus. It's interesting, I covered in last week's broadcast that, uh, that Israel was in Egypt when the plagues were poured out upon Egypt. It wasn't until the final wrath of God was poured out upon Egypt when he was about to drown the uh, Egyptians in the sea that the sea was parted, Israel was supernaturally translated through the sea to the other side, and then God drowned all the Egyptians in the sea. This, beloved, refers to what's going to be happening on earth during the last days. The church will be in the world through much of the plagues that fall upon the world during the last days, just as Israel was in Egypt when those plagues were falling out on Egypt. Now, there was protection for Israel. They were in the land of Goshen, and yet they still felt the, uh, the effects of the plague. So that, for example, when the river Nile turned to blood, Israel was affected by that. They were in the land. That's the way it's going to be for the church, beloved, when the tribulation comes. We will feel the effect of the tribulation. When the world's heart has grown cold, when lawlessness has increased, when people have lost their way, we'll still be in the world. We'll feel the effects of some of those things. But we'll be here. But at the very end, when God's about to unleash the final wrath, which is called the seven bowls of wrath in the book of Revelation, even as Israel was supernaturally translated through the sea, the sea was divided and Israel was supernaturally translated to the other side, so it will be that right before God is, uh, is about to pour out his final wrath upon the earth at the end of the great tribulation, that the rapture will take place as the, as the sea was parted, the sky will be parted, you and I that know the Lord will be lifted out, will be raptured out of the world, and then the Lord will pour out his final wrath, the final plagues upon the world, even as he drowned Egypt in the sea at the very end. Well, I hope I'm helping you to understand that understanding Passover is very important. It's important because it speaks to us of what Jesus has done for us, and it also speaks to us about how we can understand the book of Revelation and the events that will unfold on earth during the great tribulation during the last days. Now, as I indicated, uh, the Passover really is the gospel in its primitive form. Think about it. Israel was, was in bondage to Pharaoh, just as we, you and I, before we came to know the Lord, were in bondage to sin and the devil. But God sent forth a deliverer. In the Passover story, obviously, it was Moses. That's why when Jesus appeared upon the Mount of Transfiguration, when Peter, James, and John came, who appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah, right? Because the whole Hebrew Bible is prophetic. 
And so even as Moses is a symbol of Jesus and Moses came to, to bring, lead the Israelites out of, out, of, out of bondage, so Jesus came, beloved, to lead us out of bondage today. And how was this release from bondage affected? It was affected, beloved, when they put the blood, hallelujah, of the lamb over their doorposts. And so it is affected today, beloved, when we put the blood of Jesus, hallelujah, over the doorpost of our house. Now, the key of the Passover experience, in terms of the key element, of course, of Passover, is the lamb, right? Remember when Jesus came to the uh, Jordan River at the very beginning of his ministry, and he came to the Jordan River, and John the Baptist saw the, uh, the dove coming down on his head, and he heard the voice speak and say, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So the key element of Passover is the lamb who was sacrificed and whose blood was shed and applied. And I want you to consider what Exodus 12 tells us about this lamb. Jesus is the fulfillment of the lamb, but I want you to consider some of the principles or some of the properties of the lamb in its historical form all the way back in Exodus 12. Number one, God told the children of Israel that every family, listen now, had to select an un blemish lamb. And of course, Jesus is what? He's, unle in, he's unblemished. Jesus is the unblemished, pure, sinless lamb of God. It's also interesting that when it got time to, uh, to put the lamb to death, the Lord told the children of Israel in the book of Exodus that every family, listen now, had to take their own lamb. It was a very personal thing a very personal thing, and get this, when it got time to put the lamb to death, everybody in the family had to take part in putting the lamb to death. This is extremely important because remember, it's prophetic. The reason the Lord told the children of Israel in, Ex in the book of Exodus that everybody in the family, Exodus chapter 12, had to take part in putting the lamb to death is because it was showing us that it was your sin and my sin, all our sin, everybody in the family of humanity that put to death the sinless, unblemished Lamb of God. We also know that the Lord told the children of Israel in Exodus that none of the bones of the Lamb could be broken. And so because Yeshua is the final fulfillment of that, what do we read? That when He was on the cross, they came to break His bones to expedite or to, uh, to hasten up his death, but when they came to him, they found out he was already dead. And so the scripture says that none of his bones were broken in order that the prophecy would be fulfilled. One of the things that I really love in looking at the prophetic symbolism of Yeshua's fulfillment concerning this ancient holiday, 3,500 years old Passover, did you know that Jewish people have been celebrating this for 3,500 years? is this, that when the Lord told the children of Israel when they got the lamb and put it to death, he said they had to roast it then. And listen now, he said they had to eat it, listen now, and they had to eat all of it. And so the children of Israel were commanded back in Exodus 12, not only take the blood of the lamb and put it over their doorpost, but they were also commanded, yet deemed children of God, beloved ones, they were also commanded, listen now, to eat it, all of it. And so it is with us. We have to eat Jesus. We, you know, Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh, what did Jesus say? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, Jesus said, you have no life in yourself in John 6. He that eats my flesh is, 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 is true food and my blood is too, true drink. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood, Jesus said, has life in them. So we need to eat Jesus. We need to not just taste him, not just touch him, not just lick him. We need to eat all of him. Even as the Lord told the children of Israel, you need to eat it, all of it. And of course, did you know that when the Lord Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper back in Luke 22, when he took the matzah, the unleavened bread, and he broke it, and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Eat it. And then he took the juice and he lifted it and he said a blessing. The blessing that we say today in Hebrew is Baruch Atad Anai, Eloheinu Melech Alam, Barei Priha Guffin. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe who brings forth the fruit of the vine. And Jesus said, he blessed the wine and then he said to his disciples, take and drink. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins in the covenant. And so once again, we see this concept of eating Jesus. Jesus broke the masa, take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink, Jesus said, as he blessed the wine. This is my blood shed for you. And then Jesus said to them, as often as you do this, 
As often as you do the Passover, he revealed to us through Paul, as often as you have Passover, Jesus said in the New Testament, I want you to have Passover, Jesus said, in remembrance of me. Listen what again Jesus said to the Apostle Paul. As often as you celebrate Passover, do it, Jesus said, in remembrance of me. Why was he saying that? To teach us and show us that he is the fulfillment of, of Passover. He is the goal, beloved, that brings Passover to its final climactic meaning. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that Jesus, I said this earlier, Jesus, Paul tells us, has become our Passover. Now, I want to continue on and talk a little bit about the order of service that we go through when we celebrate Passover in a traditional Jewish home we have what is called a Haggadah. And what this is, it's a prayer book, and the word Haggadah means the telling. And what it is that we're telling is what God did for Israel when He delivered us out of Egypt. And so the highlight of celebrating Passover today is the telling of what the God of Israel did for us when He redeemed the Jewish people, hallelujah, out of Egypt. And what we do then is as we begin to go through the Haggadah, as we begin to go through what is called a Seder, or an order of service. The word Seder means order. We're going through the order of service. And there's a particular ritual that Jewish families will go through each year as they celebrate Passover in the home. I'm going to talk with you today about a few of the things that will happen in a traditional Jewish home as Passover is going to be a celebrated. Again, it's a happy time. It's the crown jewel of the Jewish feast days, actually the appointed days of the Lord. We as Christians partake of this, knowing that it's from Passover that the Lord's Supper comes out of, and also knowing that Jesus has become our Passover. And so this is for you as well. And it's important to understand that before Passover is actually celebrated in the Jewish home, The first thing that must happen, according to the Word of God, is they must rid the home of leaven. Now, leaven, we know in Scripture, represents sin. And so the Lord is saying, now, before you can celebrate the Passover, I want you to get all the leaven out of your home. And so Jewish families will get all their their, their leaven, all their bread products, etc., products that have leaven in them, out of their home in order to prepare themselves to celebrate Passover. And this is similar, you might say, to Moses as he stands before the Lord at the burning bush. And the Lord says to Moses, take off your sandals for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. Beloved, the Lord is saying to us, if you really want to draw near to me, if you really want to experience me, me, experience me, you're going to have to present yourself to me in a sanctified way. You're going to have to clean the leaven out of your life. If you really want to get close to me, if you really want to have fellowship with the Lamb of God, you need to purge yourself of leaven. You need to repent. That's why Jesus said, unless you repent, you will perish. And so we need to understand that we can't have Jesus without repenting. We can't have Jesus without cleansing our lives from leaven. Now, the good news, beloved, is this isn't something that we have to do on our own. We don't have to become good enough to receive Jesus. We can receive Jesus right where we're at. But we need to be authentic in our heart in repentance. We need to say, Jesus, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to give myself to these things anymore. I don't want to sin anymore. I give myself to you to obey you and to follow you. And in doing this, beloved, you in your heart are cleansing your heart of leaven. And this is necessary for salvation to take place. Because no one can come to the Lord without repenting in their heart, without repenting, without truly turning themselves over to the Lord. And so it is as we celebrate Passover, the first thing that we do is we cleanse our house of leaven. As we're about to begin the Seder, we light candles. Now, the lighting of the candles in a traditional Passover is not something that is biblically commanded, but it is a tradition. You'll notice that Jewish people do the same thing on Shabbat. They light candles at the beginning of Shabbat, and they'll also light candles at the very end of Shabbat in what is known as a Havdalah service. And the reason that Jewish people light candles uh, at the beginning of Passover or light candles at the beginning and the, at the end of the Sabbath is because the, the lighting of the candles is a beautiful tradition that speaks of separation. In other words, we're going to light the candles before the Passover begins as a way of separating this from the rest of time. Because the Lord said about Passover, this is my 
appointed day. This is my appointed time. In other words, it's holy. It's different. It's set apart. And so in order to separate it from the common, in order to separate it from the normal, we like candles to say this is separate. God said this is now Passover, so we're going to separate it from the rest of time by lighting candles. The same thing with Shabbat. The Lord said, said six days you shall do all your work, but the seventh day is holy, Shabbat. And so what do Jewish people do? They'll light the candle right before Shabbat begins to separate Shabbat from the rest of the week. And then when Shabbat ends after 24 hours, again they'll light candles in the Havdalah service, it's called. Why? They're saying once again, okay, we're marking the separation. The separation is over now. Uh, uh, Shabbat, Shabbat is over. And so the Passover ceremony begins with the lighting of the candles. Now, who do you think lights the candles in the home? Does the dad light the candles in the home? Does the husband light the candles in the home? No. The woman lights the candles in the home. And the reason that the wife or the woman of the home lights the candles in the home is twofold. Number one, there's a beautiful tradition in which we say that we have the, whim, the woman light the candles in the home because it's the woman's role. God has given the woman the divine creative anointing to set the tone in the home. Even though the husband is the head of the home, the woman is the one that really brings the ambiance of the presence and the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit into the home. And so you think about in most homes, oftentimes the dad is really, you know, focused on his job and really project oriented. And it's the woman or the wife that, or the mother that really sets the tone in the home. She's, really one, she's the one that's keeping the, the home in order. She's the one that is keeping relationships together. She's the one that is setting the uh, climate with the children. It's the woman's presence in the home that really oftentimes ushers in the presence of the Lord to create what we call uh, making a house a home. And so we honor the women by saying it's the woman that brings th this light into the home. And so the woman then will usher in the celebration of Passover by lighting the candles. There's a second reason that we traditionally have women light the candle in the Messianic community when we do a Messianic Seder. And that reason is this, because who did the Messiah come into the world through? A woman, right? We're about to celebrate Passover. And who's the fulfillment of Passover? Messiah Jesus, the Lamb of God. And how did Messiah Jesus come into the world? He came into the world, beloved, what? Through a woman. And so we have the woman light the candles. So, beloved, you and I, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile today, if you're believing in Jesus, we are celebrating Passover together. And let's remember that every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper or communion, that comes right out of the Passover. Jesus was celebrating Passover with his disciples in Luke 22, beginning in verse 14, when he said, concerning the Lord's Supper, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. It's the fulfillment of Passover. God bless you, beloved one, and shalom. Shalom Yedidim and God bless you beloved ones. We say to each other in Hebrew during this time of year, Chag Sameach. It means happy holidays. This is a very happy time of year. Passover is the celebration of freedom and deliverance. Historically, we celebrate how God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt 3,500 years ago. But today, you and I are celebrating, beloved, that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is bringing us into freedom. Yeshua said, if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. Think of how much freedom he's already brought us into. We have a long way to go, but think where you were before Yeshua saved you as compared to where you are today. Certainly there's a reason to celebrate now. We found that ancient Israel would offer to the Lord a special Passover offering because of their love and thankfulness to Him during this time of year. We read about it in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 16. Over the years, I found that many of you like to present to God a special Passover offering during this time of year because of your love for Him and thankfulness to Him for what He's done for you. I'm going to turn it over now to our senior administrator, Michael Hardy. He'll tell you exactly how you can do that, beloved. God bless you, and may your Passover offering, beloved, bring glory to God and blessings back into your life. Shalom, Chavarim. Rabbi Schneider and I are Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. 
As a Gentile believer, having partnered with Discovering the Jewish Jesus, I feel more complete as a follower of Yeshua, and I am confident that the Lord will do the same for you. Here is how you can partner with us. Send your tax-deductible gift to Discovering the Jewish Jesus, P.O. Box 777, Blissfield, Michigan, 49228. That's P.O. Box 777, Blissfield, Michigan, 49228. To make a credit card donation, call 1-800-240-1303. 1-800-240-1303. To donate securely online, go to discoveringthejewishjesus.com. To show our appreciation, we will send you an audio CD with one of Rabbi Schneider's recent teachings. If you're interested in Messianic music by Joshua James or other Messianic artists or more teaching resources by Rabbi Schneider, please go to discoveringthejewishjesus.com. To have Rabbi Schneider or a ministry team member come and speak at your congregation, please have your pastor or leader call 1-800-240-1303. For information about our upcoming trip to Israel, please go to our website, discoveringthejewishjesus.com. God bless you. Baruch Hashem and Shalom. Hi, I'm Cynthia Schneider, Rabbi Schneider's wife. I want to thank all of you who have sent in donations to make this broadcast possible. Thank you for your sacrifice, your faithfulness to the Lord. You are the pillars that hold this ministry up. And we pray for God's blessings to be poured back into your life. God bless you and Shalom. You did as we close today. I'm going to be singing over you the ironic blessing found in the book of Bamidbar or Numbers, chapter 6, verse 22 through 27. The Lord Yahweh told the children of Israel that by singing this prayer, by speaking this prayer over his people, that we'd be invoking his name on his people and that he would in turn bless us. Yahweh. <laughs> Vayishmarecha Ya'el Yahweh p'nave lecha V'ikunecha Yisad enai p'nave lecha V'asem lecha Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift you up with his countenance and may Yahweh give you his children his peace. Yes, dear Lord.